Hello and thank you for clicking on this video where I'll be talking about our latest work which is titled Rational Modular Encoding in the DCR setting on interactive branch proofs and by a based Jung in the standard model. So this is joint work with Benoit Liber and Thomas Peters and as the title suggests we will be using a particular rational encoding in order to build a non-interactive branch proof that satisfies constant rate and unboundedness. And we also instantiate the narrow Jung paradigm under the DCR assumption. So first, let me tell you about range proofs. The idea is that you have some integer value that you do not want to reveal. For instance, the amount of money on your bank account. But you want to prove that this value belongs to some range, that you have enough money to buy something, for instance. So to do so, you will commit to this value to a verifier, and then you will have to give it a proof that it belongs to the uh, intended range, and the verifier must be convinced in the end. The unboundedness property means that the CRS used to commit to the integer x uh, does not bound the values a and b and the rate, which we want constant, it's the ratio of everything you send to the verifier over the length of your, wit of your witness, your witness uh, being the integer you've committed to. So we can look at two previous examples. So first, we could try to instantiate CROTSI proofs uh, in a particular way to get range proof. We may be achieving unboundedness, but however, we do not get a constant rate. Another interesting previous work, which is more recent, is a work by Kuto and co-authors. It uses the rational encoding that we will be using too, and they use that in different settings, but in all of those settings, they don't get the unboundedness uh, property. And in our work, we notice that if we use uh, their IDs in the DCR setting, then we are able to achieve unboundedness and constant rates because of some property that DCR has and that I'll talk about later. In a second time, we'll be working on threshold public key encryption schemes which are basically the same as PKE, except that you distribute the decryption algorithm. So you have N servers, each of them has some uh, private key share, and when they get a ciphertext, they compute a partial decryption. When you recover T out of N partial decryption, then you can recombine them and recover the message N. In this setting, uh, now Jung was already instantiated under the DCR assumption, but the, the proof they used for plain text equality, the proof system they used, was flow. So it does not really hold anymore. Uh, we could also compare our results with one of our previous work, where we give also uh, well a TPKE in, under the DCR assumption that satisfies the NCCA2 security against adaptive adversaries in the standard model because it has the drawback that the uh, key shares uh, grows with the number of servers. In this work, we are proposing a new SIGMA protocol and a new way to turn it into an uninteractive proof system that lets us instantiate Nora Young in the standard model. We have a slightly weaker security because we're only secure against static adversaries uh, and that's adaptive, but the public key and key shares don't grow with the number of servers and so we have a smaller key. So let me first recall what is the Zeta decision composite residues the assumption. So basically taking N an RSA modulus it is hard to distinguish between a random n to the zeta residue or n to the zeta plus 1 and a random invertible element of z n to the zeta plus 1. It has the nice property that will let us uh, reach the unboundedness, 
that for any zeta polynomial in lambda, then it's equivalent to the zeta DCR assumption is equivalent to the one DCR assumption. So it means that with one CRS comprised of n RSA modulus, you are able to do a lot of different instantiations uh, of DCR. So that's the first tool. What we want to build is a trap the sigma protocol for gap language. So gap language, it's actually two languages with L sound being slightly bigger than LZK. And so we will see that stuff that is done honestly belongs to LZK. But when we want to prove the soundness, uh, we only prove that outside of L sound, you cannot do false proofs. So we have some gap between what we can honestly prove and not honestly prove. So other than that, it is a sigma protocol in the sense that we have a prover and a verifier. The prover computes the first statement, then the verifier returns a challenge, and the prover must respond to that challenge. Depending on this response, the verifier accepts or rejects. We want the following properties for our trapdoor sigma protocols. First, the completeness, which is if you do stuff correctly, then the verifier accepts. The special zero knowledge is that on input, uh, a statement x that belongs to LZK and a challenge, then you can generate false transcripts that are indistinguishable from a real transcript. So we have the special soundness. So as as I said, this is here where we get the gap between LZK and L sound. Because here, if X does not belong to L sound, then whatever first message you send and whatever challenge is then returned, uh, there is no accepting answer except for one challenge. So this challenge will be computed by something called the bad challenge function. Uh, but this best challenge function needs some supplementary information that is given by a trapdoor. And to get this trapdoor, you have to replace the generation of the CRS gen by the trap gen algorithm. So think of it as the CRS will always be some RSA modulus n. And so the trapdoor will always be its factorization PQ. Okay. Uh, the next tool is this uh, rational encoding. So let's say we have some rational number R over S, which uh, belongs to, so the numerator and denominator belongs to some specific range. Okay. We're going to encode it as R times S to the minus one, mod N to the zeta, where zeta is chosen in a particular way. Now, how do we extract T from its encoding? Well, we can define the following two-dimensional lattice lambda, okay, which is the xy that satisfies x, s times x is equal to y times r, mod n to the zeta. And we actually know a particular basis of this uh, lattice. Okay, this vector and this vector, they form basis of it. And so we are able to use Gauss algorithm to recover R and S. This was proven in a previous work, so we can recover uh, R and S. So using this, we can define the following encryption over rationals. So this is basically uh, the damgard yorick encryption scheme, okay? where the zeta is chosen accordingly depending on the size of the message that you want to encrypt. Okay, so you choose zeta in a particular way and then you compute a pi encryption of the message over the zeta you've chosen. And to decrypt, you actually get some message prime using the same encryption algorithm as in the damgard yorick encryption scheme. But at the end, you use Gauss algorithm 
to write the message as the encoding of some rational number. Okay, so this lets you apply homomorphic um, homomorphic operations on ciphertext, even over rationals, but still get a correct decryption in the end. So we move to the first result. So let's say I have an integer x. I take it in 0b because if it was in some a, I could simply consider x minus a to get it back to that case. So the commitment I will consider to that integer is an encryption of it from the previous scheme. Okay? And actually, what we will do is we'll commit to the following uh, to the following integers where we actually write 1 plus 4 times b minus x times x as the sum of three squares. And so what we actually want to prove membership of, it's of... So you take four encryptions and you want to see that they are encryption of uh, four integers that satisfies this relation, this relation. Okay, and actually what we can prove is that if we prove membership of that language, then we prove, uh, we give a convincing proof that x is in 0b. So we have to consider, since we are working with gap uh, languages, we need a, a soundness language. In this soundness language, it's actually uh, the same, except that they are encryption uh, of encoded rationals. And because of the rounding operation at the end, well, when you decrypt, you may not get this, this to be true anymore, even if it holds inside this language. So this is why this, this is a soundness language, which is slightly bigger. Because this may not hold, but uh, the values are not too far from one another. So how do we do that? So let's say that I have, so my statement is the commitment to my integer. Okay, so that's the encryption. And my witness, it's x and the randomness I used. So now p, as we said before, will generate encryption of the decomposition uh, that we proposed before. Okay, so this is all, this is everything I put in red. Uh, xi and the randomness si that were used. Then it will need fresh randomness that I put in green. And it computes the following encryption r, which may seem a bit weird at first, but not the following. If r0, you change it into b minus x0, and ri, you turn it into the red xi, then all that Okay, it's just an encryption of 1. So this will be important later, so try to keep it in mind. And then for consistency, it encrypts the, R, the RI used before in big RI. And it sends all of that in the end. The commitment, the encryption, and the value R. Then it gets a challenge, uh, which belongs to 0, 2 to the lambda minus 1. And it is computing, most importantly, zi, which is ri plus child times xi, and then some randomness values that are consistent with zi. Consistent in the following way. Uh, v will be checking the following things. First, it checks that ri and ci are consistent with the zi, in the sense that they must satisfy this property. Okay. And most importantly, it computes this value, this Boolean value. And we see the following. So ci to the minus zi. When we look at it uh, and expand it, we see that the red part, as I said before, you know, 
all of that, the beginning of the cipher text, it will be an encryption of one times char. So this encryption of one times char, we've computed it in the reverse way. So we can remove it with the last uh, thing we added here. But we still have all of the leftover green stuff that is multiplied by the red, red stuff contained in the CIs. And this is a this will be exactly what R is, you know, because it is uh, green stuff times red stuff. This is just to give you an intuition of what's going on. Uh, you can spend more time thinking about it. And in the end, we see that this Sigma protocol is satisfying all of the desired uh, properties. So first, it is complete. It satisfies the special zero knowledge property. It also has the special soundness and CRS indistinguishability. And the bad challenge function is actually a bit complicated because it uses linear programming and Lenstra's algorithm. Uh, but the important result is that it satisfies unboundedness. So it means that when we fix n, so the CRS, you know, it's n. P times Q. And the thing is, we are not constraining the value B here at all, uh, because whatever value B you take here, then we will take the zeta for the commitment accordingly. So this is why we reach unboundedness. Then we also uh, achieve constant rate because well, we can compute uh, what it is that we have in a full transcript. And we will see that because of the way we choose zeta to be the smallest integer that is close to the x size and x and everything, uh, we get the constant rate. But most importantly, we want a non-interactive range proof. So to do so, we want to compile all of that into a multi-theorem non-interactive zero knowledge proof, but we don't want to lose the unboundedness property or nor the constant rate property. And we can do so using uh, different or tricks and uh, other properties like that. So next, we move to how we instantiated the Naur Jung uh, paradigm under the DCR assumption in the threshold setting. So, to give you a bit more insight on how a threshold public key encryption scheme works, it's actually a five level of algorithms key, genera key gen, ANC, partial decryptions, partial verification, and combine. The partial verification algorithm I won't talk about here because this is something we can add on top of everything at the end. So the idea is that for the sender, nothing changes from a regular PKE. But when you want to decrypt, you have forwarded secret key shares to each server. So you forward the ciphertext to each of them, and they compute a partial decryption of the message and when you have uh, at least t uh, at least t that you gave as a parameter here out of the number of servers then you can use the combined algorithm to recover the message m if it, if the tpk is correct so m prime is equal to m so what kind of security do we consider for tpke in our case, we are interested in the static in CCA2 security. Uh, this security is as follows. The adversary chooses a, num you know, a threshold T and a set of corrupted adversaries C, which is comprised of exactly T minus one servers. And the challenger, it will generate the public key and secret key accordingly to the choice of the threshold, and it will return the public key and 
the secret key shares of corrupted servers. So this is an NCCA2 security. So you have access to not a decryption algorithm because there is none here, but you have access to every partial decryption algorithm for each of the servers. And also you have the challenge query at some point as in NCCA2 security for PKEs. And you have to guess which message was encrypted. Uh, another interesting point is that you can make decryption queries for the challenge as long as you don't trivially win. So it means that if you make decryption queries for the challenge, then these queries must be made for servers that were corrupted at the beginning. So what we want to build uh, in particular, it is a Trapdoor Sigma protocol for the language of ciphertexts that encrypt the same message M, but over different modules, N1 and N2, okay? In the case of the soundness language, since we are considering gap languages, uh, it is simply that we are encrypting not only a message, an integer message, but we are encrypting a rational which belongs to, well, where the numerator and denominator belongs to this range. Okay, of course, uh, zeta must correspond to some particular uh, choice, minimalizing the minimalizing the the modulus, uh, but still allowing for correct decryption at the end. So how do we do that? Well, this is a bit more uh, standard because we are actually encrypting some random first message uh, for both modulus, okay? So we produce two, two ciphertexts, then we get a random challenge, and what we have to provide the verifier is the following message, a plus child times m, and we have to provide the randomness to make sure that we can compute well, to make sure that if you encrypt Z using this randomness, then you get the homomorphic encryption of A plus child M using the big AB and the commitment CT1, CT2. So what V is checking is indeed that if you compute this homomorphic encryption, which is normally an encryption of C by choice of child, then you should get exactly this encryption where everything was provided here. So once again, we have the completeness, special zero knowledge, special soundness, and CRS indistinguishability properties. And once more, the bad challenge function, so it uses as trapdoor the factorization of N1 and N2, and it still needs to use linear programming and Lenstra's algorithm in order to find the bad challenge. Also, uh, for what we want to use it in, we are actually giving a new way to term this previous uh, protocol into a one-time simulation sound on interactive zero-knowledge proof system. Because this new compiler, it lets us do so without imposing a bound on the plain text space, which is exactly what we want, because we would like to uh, be as close as possible to the Damgard Zurich encryption scheme. So, to give you a brief intuition of the construction. Well, we start by instantiating twice Damgard Zurich and we take the secret key of the first instantiation and share it using Shamir secret share. Then what is a ciphertext? A ciphertext, it's simply an encryption under both schemes. And also we add a proof using a previous construction that the plain texts encrypted are the same for both messages. 
Then how do we decrypt? Well, we can use the partial secret key to so we can take first we verify the proof. If the proof is wrong, then we don't do anything. If it's right, if it's accepted, then we use we, we compute the first ciphertext to the power something times the partial secret key. As would be the first step of uh, the Damgardioric decryption. And when we have enough partial decryptions, then we can recombine. And to recombine, we have to recover the secret key in the exponent of the decryptions. So we can do it, and then we can run the rest of the Damgardioric decryption uh, scheme. And by doing so, we achieve CCA2 security under static corruption queries. And moreover, you'll notice that since we only have familiar secret sharing and N1, N2 as public keys, then the public and secret key shares don't depend on the number of servers that we had before. So this is it. Uh, I thank you for your attention and for watching this video up until the end. Um, please look forward.